People that have left Scientology have said, I was brainwashed or I was under undue influence when I was within the organization. And I would say that it is uh, very much similar to other groups that I have dealt with that have been called cults. That is, there is isolation, there is information control, and people become embedded either through hyperactivity or other means into a kind of subculture within Scientology. And they really don't listen to or hear other information that is deemed inappropriate by Scientology, and they frequently cut off any alternate frame of reference, that is, people that might provide another perspective. So you have the pheno phenomenon of a kind of milieu or environment control, uh, information control, and within that environment, people can be manipulated. Scientology specifically manipulates people, in my opinion, through its course curriculum and what is called auditing. Auditing is a Scientology process where a Scientologist goes into an, uh, a Scientology center, uh, typically, and they will then uh, go through auditing uh, with a person who is called an auditor, and they will hold two uh, metal cans that are connected by wires to a box that is called an e-meter, which is really, in, in, in fact, a part of what can be seen as a, a polygraph machine. It measures uh, galvanic response or tension in your hands. It shows that you are nervous. And the needle will move when you are, are nervous. And it will float when you are calm. So in this way, the auditor who works with Scientology or for Scientology uh, can tell when the person who is being audited is nervous and the auditor will ask many questions. Uh, how is your personal life going? How are you doing at work? Uh, how, is, how is your uh, father, your mother? Uh, and they will go through this process with you, asking you many, many questions, and they will watch to see if the needle moves. If the needle moves, that denotes that you need more questions on a particular area, and they'll drill down. This, in Scientology, is what Lifton calls the cult of confession. Shine was then followed by Robert J. Lifton, who studied POWs held by the North Koreans during the Korean conflict. And he then wrote the book Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, which was published in 1961. Lifton was a professor at Harvard Medical School and also the John Jay School of, of Law. So, he basically, in the 22nd chapter of the book, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, came up with eight criteria to determine whether or not a thought reform program is ongoing. And these criteria are basically a snapshot of the engine that drives what we call brainwashing. And it's composed of milieu control, which is control of the environment, everything you see and experience. Uh, then mystical manipulation. Things appear to happen spontaneously, but in fact they are really contrived, scripted, and not spontaneous. Then there is the demand for purity, which is the demand that a person divide their entire life into black and white, the pure and the impure. There are no shades of gray, no middle ground. And then the cult of confession, that is that there is no area of a person's life that they are entitled to privacy, that the group has the right to demand confession about almost anything, even about things that may not really even be true. Uh, there is a kind of element of purging going on where everything about a person's life is being examined and being confessed to the group. And then Lifton calls uh, another of his criteria the sacred science, which is that what the group teaches is absolute, that it cannot be questioned, and that anyone who questions it is unholy, unscientific, absolutely wrong. So that this is uh, an absolute belief 
that the group's beliefs can never be questioned, can never be critically questioned in any way. Then there is uh, the element of what Lifton calls loaded language, which means thought terminating cliches that are used to sum things up in a way that stops critical thinking. Uh, for example, uh, in, in Scientology, uh, people who are not Scientologists are suspected of being suppressive persons or potential trouble sources, which means a person that might be connected to a suppressive person. So there are these cliches, these labels within a particular group that terminate critical thinking. I don't have to consider what you have to say because you're a suppressive person, you're an SP, or a PTS, a potential trouble source. And then there is the criteria doctrine over person. And that is basically everything around you must be cataloged according to the group. Uh, your own feelings, your thoughts, your emotions must be cataloged according to the doctrine of the group. Whatever is consistent with the group is valid. Whatever is inconsistent is invalid and must be purged. And then finally, the most devastating of Lifton's criteria is the dispensing of existence. And that is literally the right to exist. Uh, the person who leaves the group ceases to exist. If they come back, they can exist again. Uh, family and friends that question the group, you can cut them off, dispense with their existence. So you take these eight criteria, and it doesn't matter what the group says it's doing. Uh, if six of the eight are ongoing and evident, it's enough to run a thought reform program. If you will, what Lifton is saying is that each one of these criteria is like a piece in a machine. One relies on the other. The cult of confession uh, enables mystical manipulation, enables the dispensing of existence. The dispensing of existence cuts off an outside frame of reference and reinforces milieu control. So what you can see is how one of these criteria enables and reinforces another. That there are no boundaries, that you get all kinds of information from people through these auditing sessions. The auditor takes copious notes, and those notes go into what's called your pre-clear file or your PC folder, and that becomes the property of Scientology. You, uh, if you are in a Scient Scientology, you will sign a release in which you acknowledge that Scientology has possession of your file and that you have no rights to it. And then you go through your auditing sessions and Scientology is finding out all about you. You also uh, go through a, a lot of courses with Scientology and you go through training routines. And in the training routines, in my opinion, the point of the training routines, or TRs as uh, people like Tom Cruise would, would call them, it, it really is more about submission. It's just about submitting yourself to the process and becoming a deployable pawn. Uh, there are exercises where people simply surrender their will. And in the training routines, uh, the, your partner in TRs will point you to a direction, uh, tell you to see the wall or to perform some function. And in my opinion, the, the real purpose, under the underlying agenda of the TRs, is to get people to submit, to get them to surrender, to become pliable and engender dependency upon the training to establish reality, uh, to create uh, a, a perspective for the person who is going through the training, to create a mindset regarding Scientology. And when you go through uh, the process of these courses and you go through the process of confession, which is achieved through these auditing sessions, uh, if you don't disclose information, in Scientology that's called a withhold. You are withholding. And people who withhold 
are immediately suspected of being a potential trouble source, which means that you are being affected by a suppressive person, an SP, which is a negative label. Again, I would say that correlates with Lifton's loaded language or thought terminating cliches. And that is that Scientology can potentially label anyone an SP. And if they label someone an SP, a suppressive person, there is a ritual within Scientology where you disconnect from that person. You eliminate them from your life. And uh, this would be, again, in Lifton, uh, where he talks about thought reform, the dispensing of existence. That is, labeling a person an SP means they have no right to exist in your life. And then people who withhold may be exposed to an SP. That's why they're withholding information, which Scientology has basically the right to know everything about you through auditing. And so if you withhold, you might be a suspect. You might be a suspicion. If you withhold, you might be a suspect. You might be a PTS, a potential trouble source, because you are associating with an SP, a suppressive person. And this is Scientology's way of hectoring and controlling your life, eliminating any uh, outside feedback, any alternative perspectives by labeling them with loaded language. That person's an SP. That person is PTS. And then they can make the demand on you to confess by saying, you are withholding bring out the information. And then in the auditing sessions, they can then drill down and find out what is your Achilles heel? What is your, as Scientology says, your ruin? What is your most vulnerable uh, spot? And in this way, they can begin to manipulate you and move you along their bridge which in my opinion is a bridge based on brainwashing. And as you go up the operating Thetan levels, which are different levels of Scientology, first you go through the courses and the training routines, and eventually you reach what's called clear, or, or really zero. At that point you then, if you continue paying, can pay your way up the various levels of Scientology, beginning with operating Thetan level one, and then there comes two and three, and it goes all the way up to eight. Tom Cruise, I believe, is an OT7. John Travolta, I think, is an OT7. Uh, I've heard Jenna Elfman is also an OT7. So you, you move up these levels. As you go through all of this training and this auditing and everything, Scientology is learning everything about you. It's going into your pre-clear folder, which is their intellectual property, which you have signed away your rights to. Scientology knows your secrets. Scientology knows everything. And if you withhold, that is the equivalent of a sin in Scientology. And then you can become a suspect, a potential trouble source a PTS. So then comes the next layer of control, which is that Scientology has different people performing different tasks. They have the auditor, who is, if you will, in my view, micromanaging confessions and, and, and streaming information back to the, the people in Scientology about you. And then there are people that are called ethics officers. Uh, these are the people that police Scientology. And those ethics officers are going to hear about any withholds, any breaches of ethics, anything inappropriate that you have done according to Scientology. Any questioning of the basic assumptions of L. Ron Hubbard's theories, et cetera. And so that ethics officer will then basically confront you. And you can be uh, put on report. There are uh, uh, your, your family members, uh, your friends who are in Scientology could potentially 
report on you and do an ethics report in which they report you to an ethics officer for breaching Scientology protocol or breaching the ethics as laid out by L. Ron Hubbard. In, in this sense, the structure that L. Ron Hubbard created in the 50s and the 60s, which is interesting because it was at the same time that Edgar Schein and Robert J. Lifton were publishing their initial research in books about thought reform and coercive persuasion. Uh, I've often wondered if Hubbard read those books as they came out and that he used them as a means of informing the structure that he created that became the course curriculum and the training of Scientology. Because what I see when I look at the training, and I've looked at it, and all of the courses and so on, uh, and I've looked at much of it over the years, I see parallels of it matching up to elements of thought reform or brainwashing. And so Hubbard created a kind of machine that continues to exist even after his death. Now the machine is run by David Miscavige. When Hubbard was alive, he ran it, arguably in the final years before his death in 86, he may not have been that coherent. And ironically, when Hubbard died, uh, they found traces of a psychotropic drug in his bloodstream, according to numerous reports. So was Hubbard mad in the end? Why didn't Scientology work for L. Ron Hubbard? Uh, the accounts that have been written about the end of his life seem to mirror a man who was very lost, very disturbed, uh, seemingly incoherent at times, uh, and out of touch with reality. So if Hubbard, who invented the training, uh, wasn't given mental acuity or clarity through it, how can it be good for us? And I think that many of the people that I've talked to that are former Scientologists will say that the training was not beneficial and that in fact it was, it was uh, enormously stressful and that at certain points they began to crack. And I think it's arguable that Scientology is not good for your mental health as opposed to the answer for mental health as advertised. I have done interventions to get people out of Scientology. Uh, two that come to mind, uh, one that I talk about in depth in my book, Cults Inside Out, was a man who joined Scientology as, uh, at a very young age and stayed in for 27 years. Uh, his family became increasingly disturbed when he talked about uh, becoming a, a member of full-time staff of Scientology. Uh, the full-time staff in Scientology are called the C organization. That's S-E-A. L. Ron Hubbard used to be in the Navy. He was an officer in the Navy during World War II, and he fancied the staffers of Scientology being kind of like his Navy. In fact, during one point when Hubbard uh, was running Scientology, he ran it from a, a, a vessel, a naval vessel, that was uh, floating in the ocean. Uh, he didn't want to uh, be held accountable, and he kind of literally made himself into a, a moving island that could not be held accountable by anyone. Uh, so at any rate, Hub this man uh, was going to become a member of the Sea Organization, or Sea Org as it's known, and become a full-time staffer, leaving behind his wife, who was not a Scientologist, and his children. So the family decided to do an intervention, and that intervention was successful, and I was able to help this man leave Scientology, and uh, he did leave and has, has never gone back. Uh, interesting that at one point in the uh, intervention, I think what he found particularly interesting, and I talk about this in the book, was that if Scientology is based on science, which is the idea that L. Ron Hubbard posited, which is that Scientology is a hybrid of spirituality, uh, a kind of therapy, catharsis, and it's based somehow on science, 
I would argue that it's pseudoscience. But be that as it may, I said to the man that I work with in the intervention, if Scientology is science or scientific, science changes because research keeps changing science. We learn more and it evolves. And I pointed out that there were certain theories of Hubbard, for example, that toxins remain in fatty tissues of the human body indefinitely, which have been proven false by scientific research. And I said, why can't Scientology accept that scientifically Science evolves, it moves on based on new facts, new research, and yet uh, through Scientology's drug rehabilitation program called Narconon, they would not change their, their theory, which uh, is very important to Narconon, that toxins or drugs remain in fatty tissues in the body indefinitely, and that you need to go through what is called the purification rundown which is a process of saunas, ingesting uh, vegetable oil, taking high doses of niacin to, Hubbard thought, leach the toxins or, or, or drugs out of your body and become purified. And uh, that uh, process is based on the idea that the drugs remain in the fatty tissues of the body indefinitely, and the only way to get them out is the purification rundown. And I said to the man, this is not science. Uh, it has been disproven. Uh, toxins are dispelled from the body over a period of time, and they do not reside permanently in fatty tissues. And why can't Scientology acknowledge that? And I think for him, that was a, a, a point of reckoning, where he realized that Scientology was not scientific and that it did fit Robert J. Lifton's description of a sacred science, that is, that it was rigid, that it was absolute, that it could never be questioned, and, and that disturbed him. And that was the beginning of him realizing that Scientology had uh, used a thought reform process on him. And he came to that, uh, to that point, and he decided to leave. Another intervention I did was with a 14-year-old minor child. Uh, her brother was involved with Scientology, and he was recruiting her into Scientology. And Scientology actually wanted her to become a Sea Organization or Sea Org member at one of their facilities. And they sent the parents a release where they would literally sign their daughter away to Scientology at the age of 14. And the parents called me and they said, this is just wrong and we want your help. And so I came and we did an intervention and the daughter decided that she no longer wanted to be involved with Scientology despite her affection for her brother and the fact that uh, he was involved. There are many celebrities involved in Scientology uh, Tom Cruise, for example, who is arguably one of the biggest movie stars in the world. And people wonder, how can someone like Tom Cruise be involved in Scientology? I mean, he's an intelligent guy. He's had a terrific career. He's made many great motion pictures. Why him? Or John Travolta, who, who to many people is a very charming, very affable man, a very nice person. Why is he involved in Scientology? And I would say that celebrities are no different than any of us, and that they can be tricked, they can be trapped, and that given the amount of disclosure that's involved in Scientology, who knows what's in Tom Cruise's pre-clear folder or John Travolta's pre-clear folder, and why they feel maybe that they can't leave Scientology. Also, if you do leave Scientology, and this is a very serious point about Scientology, and it's been brought out by many people who left and many people who hesitated and didn't want to leave for a long time. If you leave Scientology, they have what they call a disconnection policy. And that means that if you leave, you may be declared a suppressive person, an SP. And that means that uh, those people that are your family or your friends, 
that are in Scientology must disconnect from you. That is the disconnection policy. You are declared a suppressive person. You then must be disconnected from. And, and then there's the next layer. People who don't disconnect from a suppressive person are a potential trouble source. And no one in Scientology wants to be called a PTS. So this is the conundrum. If I leave, will my family disconnect from me? If I leave, will all my friends disconnect from me? This has kept people from leaving Scientology. And it's also caused people to actually reconsider their involvement. I mean, the, the director, Paul Hadges, talks about this. He talks about how when his wife's parents left Scientology, uh, she was being encouraged to disconnect from them. And uh, she didn't want to, uh, but she was willing to. And then Paul Hadges was not willing to. And then subsequently, when uh, a Scientology spokesperson was asked uh, in an interview that was on television, what was this all about, the disconnection policy, the Scientology spokesperson denied that it existed and acted as if it was a myth. Uh, this really upset Paul Hadges, the director, because he thought to himself, I know about this policy. I've experienced it. I know about it firsthand. If we have a policy like this within Scientology, and Hadges was a member for 35 years, they should just be proud of it, stand by it, and be honest about it. And he felt very, uh, very uncomfortable with the fact that they were avoiding the discussion and would not admit that they had this policy. Scientology seems to be shrinking. Uh, I would estimate that there are no more than 50,000 Scientologists globally, worldwide. Uh, Scientology will say they have millions of members around the globe and that they're growing constantly. But when you look at the buildings that are empty, and when you, when you look at events and you really get a sense of where they're at right now and how many people have left, and many, many people have left, it appears that Scientology is in fact shrinking. 